Well, hello everyone. My name is Chloe May, and today I'll be presenting my research, The Role of Aortic Root Anatomy in Transcatheter Aortic Valve Replacement, a Cadaveric Study. Before I begin, I want to go ahead and thank the rest of my amazing research team, including Dr. Hillard and the rest of the Joplin Anatomy Fellows. The aortic root is an amalgamation of structures in the proximal ascending aorta that connects the heart to the rest of the systemic circulation. Among these structures are the aortic annulus, which anchors your aortic valve, the sinotubular junction, which is this ridge here that separates the aortic root from the rest of the aorta, the sinus of alsalva, which is this large pocket here that's home to your individual aortic sinuses, your aortic cusps, uh, which make up your aortic valve, and then your aortic commissures, which separate your aortic cusps. There are three aortic cusps that make up your aortic valve. These are the anterior aortic sinus, the right, well, the left posterior aortic sinus, and your right posterior aortic sinus. Between these structures, we have our aortic commissures. Commissure one separates the anterior aortic sinus from the right posterior aortic sinus. Commissure two separates the right posterior and left posterior aortic sinuses, and commissure three separates the left posterior and anterior aortic sinuses. Lastly, we have our left and right coronary ostia, which serve as the origination points for your left and right coronary arteries, respectively. The left coronary ostium sits in the left posterior aortic sinus, whereas the right coronary ostium sits in the anterior aortic sinus. I know that I just threw a bunch of anatomy terms at everybody. I, I, I promise there won't be a quiz or anything later, um, but it's important to introduce these structures that, so that I can talk about how they're clinically relevant. And in order to do so, I need to introduce you to uh, transcatheter aortic valve replacement, commonly referred to as TABOR. So TABOR is approved for the treatment of severe aortic stenosis in patients that have high surgical risk. In the TABOR procedure, a catheter is introduced into the femoral uh, artery and routed up to the aorta. Once in the aorta, the catheter is directed along the course of the aorta until the aortic valve is reached. Then an artificial valve is deployed from the catheter and expanded to fill the dimensions of the aortic root. This artificial valve can now act in place of the patient's native valve, but the native valve still remains attached to that aortic annulus. The addition of this artificial valve, however, can disrupt uh, surrounding anatomy. As you can imagine, you have an artificial valve in there, we have a native valve in there, it can get a little bit routed. And this disruption can lead to the development of coronary osteal obstruction or COO. Coronary osteal obstruction occurs when an artificial valve is inserted and expanded during TABOR. The expansion of this balloon can cause the artificial valve or the native valve leaflets to obstruct the coronary ostia, thus ceasing blood flow back to the heart. This condition is referred to as coronary osteal obstruction, and it can lead to a variety of signs and symptoms, including severe persistent hypotension and ECG changes. While the likelihood of developing this condition is slim, you know, about a 0.6% chance of this happening post-TAVER, it confers a 40 to 50% 30-day mortality rate, making it a fear for clinicians. Several anatomical risk factors have been identified in COO patients, including low aortic, uh, narrow aortic annulus, low sinus of alsalva diameter, and a uh, low left coronary osteal height. So the left coronary uh, narrow aortic root annulus and a low sinus of alsalva diameter leave less room for the valve to expand, thus causing there to be some more crowding it and crowding and making it more likely for one of the leaflets, either a native leaflet or an artificial valve leaflet, to become displaced over a coronary ostium. Furthermore, uh, low LCO height uh, is more likely to become occluded when an artificial valve is expanded, either by the artificial valve itself or the upward and outward motion of the native valve during and after expansion. The crux of this project lies in trying to identify risk factors for COO in a Midwestern population such as ours. Coronary circulation, including the origination points of our coronary arteries, is known to vary by geographic region, so identifying specific changes in uh, the aortic root in a Midwestern population is crucial for understanding the risk of COO in this region. Furthermore, our study seeks to identify trends and measurements across biometric information and medical history. We utilized 47 formalin-involved cadavers from the Kansas City University Gift Body Program and dissected on both the KC and Joplin campuses. Aortas were detached from the heart and pinned flat against a cushioned surface like this. Um, 
in order to obtain our measurements more accurately. We used digital calipers to gather triplicate measurements, which were later averaged. Then we compared our measurements across biometric information and medical history using Welch's t-test for sex and history of cardiovascular disease and linear regression models for age and body mass index. This is a drawing of an aorta that has been cut at commissure three and laid flat. So moving from left to right, you can see the right coronary ostium in the right posterior aortic sinus, in the anterior aortic sinus, my apologies. So right coronary ostium in the anterior aortic sinus, the right posterior aortic sinus, and then the left coronary ostium in the left posterior aortic sinus. These colored lines represent where we took our measurements for aortic annulus circumference, sinotubular junction circumference, sinus of Alsalva circumference, aortic cusp heights, osteal heights, and the distance between the ostea and the upper margin of their respective cusp. Uh, this, these circumference measurements were then converted to diameter and area to get the measurements that you will see in our results section. So speaking of results, this table shows our population averages for all of our measurements. I want to first go ahead and draw attention to the left coronary osteal height in our population. Our average LCO height was 12.71 plus or minus 2.51 millimeters, and this value is higher than that identified in an international multicenter registry study conducted by Ribeiro et al., which showed an average LCO height of 10.61 plus or minus 2.1 millimeters in patients with confirmed COO. However, some commercial valve manufacturers put their minimum osteal height recommendations at greater than or equal to 14 millimeters. Therefore, while our average LCO height is higher than that identified in COO patients, the recommendations set in place by some valve manufacturers could discourage surgeons from doing taper procedures on members of our population. Now let's look at our sinus of Alsalva diameter. In that same multicenter registry study conducted by Ribio et al., they concluded that an SOV diameter of less than 30 millimeters puts a patient at risk for COO. Therefore, based on our data, we can conclude that most of these patients would be considered at risk for COO if they underwent a TAPER procedure. We found no statistically significant differences when comparing our data across age, BMI, or history of cardiovascular disease. However, we did see significant differences when making comparisons across sex. Furthermore, when breaking down the average measurements for males versus females, we can appreciate that females have lower average measurements than men in all categories where our T-test found significance. Some of these areas where women are showing significantly lower measurements than men have been identified as clinical risk factors for the development of COO, especially the narrow aortic root annulus and the smaller sinus of Alsalva diameter. This finding is consistent with the multicenter registry study by Ribeiro et al. as they showed that most patients that were developing COO were women. So this is consistent across our clinical studies as well. So what can we do to prevent patients from developing COO? The first step is adequate preoperative planning, which can be done with imaging modalities such as multi-detector computed tomography or MDCT. MDCT takes a series of multi-planar images that are used to reconstruct a 3D image of the aortic root, which you can kind of see over here if you can see my mouse right now. So this includes measurements of our AA area, any aortic leaf calcifications that are present, and even our osteal heights. So MDCT is being accepted as a standard of care as the 3D images rendered from it have been shown to lead to uh, better clinical decision-making as well as improved patient outcomes. Additionally, transthoracic uh, uh, echocardiograms can also be used to assess the aortic root, but it requires the movement of the probe along different axes in order to visualize multiple planes. So this is just a little bit less work for the clinicians and it leads to pretty pretty accurate images that have been shown to improve uh, outcomes. So transesophageal echocardiogram can be used in addition to either MDCT or TTE, transthoracic echocardiogram, uh, to assess the aortic root. This can help overcome some of the pitfalls of TTE, like not being able to adequately assess the osteal height um, due to low re resolution and some other reasons along those lines. Uh, furthermore, it's beneficial for those that have contraindications to CT, such as renal dysfunction. While imaging can be used as a tool for preoperative planning, we also have an option for mitigating uh, the risk of CO intraoperatively. So cor currently, coronary protection is being explored as a strategy in patients with low LCO heights observed on CT. Coronary protection involves inserting a guide wire, stent, or coronary balloon into the coronary artery to maintain its patency during TABOR. 
While this is only being explored in those with low LCO heights, our data stands to reason that this intraoperative procedure may also be beneficial for those with so smaller overall aortic root dimensions, including females. Our conclusion is that although further data is needed regarding the variability in the aortic root and its potential to cause COO based on anatomical risk factors, our study does add to the current knowledge. Ultimately, understanding anatomical risk factors for developing COO and specific variations in aortic root anatomy provides insight into the need for effective CT screening prior to TABOR and appropriate intraoperative management. Missouri and Kansas are among the top 20 states for aortic root uh, stenosis-related mortality. Uh, and while TABOR is on the rise in comparison to surgical uh, aortic valve replacement, this progress is moving a little bit more slowly in the Midwest. As TABOR grows in usage, we may see increased cases of COO in our region due to geographic variations in anatomy. Thus, further cadaveric and CT studies are needed to get a better grasp on the issue of COO in this region. I again want to thank my research team, including Dr. Hillard, Swathi, uh, Cameron, and Dom. And above all else, I want to thank our amazing donor population and the Kansas City University Gift Body Program. These donors are a wonderful asset to our education and to research, and we are so privileged to have them here on both campuses. Uh, here are the references that I used in this presentation. Uh, I just want to thank everybody for the opportunity to present our findings. Does anybody have any questions regarding the research?